to all of you. What a wonderful number we have present here for the Bible School Hour. And what a great privilege it is on my part to be here. I appreciate so very much uh, the honor and the invitation to come and to preach in a series of gospel meetings at the South Florida Avenue Church of Christ in Lakeland, Florida. Now, I've been told that you really wanted to have Hugh Hefner here <laughs> for your meeting. And uh, Mr. Hefner was not available. I think his preaching license had probably expired if he had ever had one. And uh, in uh, lieu of Mr. Hefner, you decided to get Hugh Fulford. So I am glad that you invited Hugh Fulford rather than Hugh Hefner. Actually, I have been here before, and I made such a tremendous impression that all of you remember it. <laughs> It was about 1977 or 78, I do not remember the exact year, and I was not here for a regular service, but Brother B.C. Carr had invited me to come down and to be one of the speakers on the School of Preaching lectureship that year, as I said, uh, about 1977 or 78. So I remember being here, and... Uh, it's an honor to be back. In fact, when I was here before, I stayed in the home of an aunt and uncle of mine who were residents of Lakeland, but they were not members of the church. And they came over to the building the first uh, night I was here and uh, picked me up, and I stayed with them, I think, two nights uh, during my stay here in Lakeland. So I'm acquainted with uh, Lakeland, I'm acquainted with the state of Florida, and I may have a little more to say about that as we go along through the week. If you have your Bible with you this morning, I would invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. <clears throat> we'll be reading the first 13 verses and they record one of our Lord's well-known parables, known as the parable of the five wise and five foolish virgins. Let's read this text together. And I will be reading from, teaching from, and preaching from the new King James Version of the Bible. Jesus is the speaker, and he says, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No lest there not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour 
in which the Son of Man is coming. I grew up in a day and time, and here's where I will inject another bit of Florida into my life. I grew up as a young child and early teenage boy up in the panhandle town of Defuniac Springs. Has anyone ever heard of it? Well, I went to school there from uh, the first grade through the 10th grade, and then we moved to Florence, Alabama. But I grew up in a day and a time and a place where neighbors were neighbors, and we freely borrowed items from one another. My mother might be cooking something and discover that she was in need of an item, and she would say, Hugh, would you go across the street and see if you can borrow two eggs from Mrs. Harrison? Or would you go over to Ms. McHenry and see if uh, I could get a cup of sugar from her? Or go over next door to Miss Huggins and see if I can borrow a cup of flour from her? We freely borrowed from one another. That was a part of life. We borrowed cooking items, we borrowed vehicles, we would loan a vehicle to someone else whose car might be uh, broken down and uh, they need transportation for the moment. We would loan money to one another. It was just a part of being neighbors, being family, and being friends. I've always enjoyed the comic strips. I always have enjoyed uh, Blundy, Dagwood Bumstead, and how he and his neighbor Herb Woodley freely borrow tools from each other. And sometimes the other one would keep the other person's tool so long that he began to think that this is my tool, this is my saw, this is my hammer. And Dagwood would come to get his hammer back and Herb would say, no, that's not your hammer, that's my hammer. And they'd get in a big fuss and a big fight over uh, uh, who's tool that one's was. But the point is that we borrowed things from each other. And Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 42, give to him who asks of you and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. We need to be friendly. We need to be neighborly. We need to be helpful. That's a part, I think, of being a down-to-earth, everyday Christian. But at the same time, we need to exercise caution and restraint in this matter as in nearly all matters of life. We might remember that the wise man Solomon said in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7, the borrower becomes the lender's slave. And if you've ever taken out a 25 or 30 year mortgage on a house or another piece of property, you know precisely what that verse of scripture means. As long as you owe the lender, as long as you owe the institution that loaned you the money, you are in a sense the slave of that lender. But now on the other hand, as is so forcefully illustrated in the passage that I read this morning from Matthew 25 about the five wise and the five foolish virgins, there are some things that cannot be borrowed. The five foolish virgins went to the wedding feast with no extra oil for their lamps. They made no preparation for the fact that the bridegroom might delay his coming. The five wise anticipated that that might be a reality, and so they took along extra oil in their vessels for their lamps. And sure enough, the bridegroom did delay his coming, and the five foolish virgins ran out of oil, and they wanted to borrow oil from the five wise who had made preparation for this event, but the five wise said, no, nothing doing. That's not possible. 
lest there not be enough for us and you. Now, they were not being selfish in that. They were simply being wise, and they were recognizing the importance of their maintaining their preparation for the bridegroom's coming. Let's focus for a few minutes in this Bible school hour this morning on some spiritual things that cannot be borrowed. In other words, things that we must do for ourselves. Discipleship. Becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. Being a faithful follower of Christ. That is not something that can be borrowed. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, If anyone would come after me and be my disciple, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Brother Bob McAnally cannot be a disciple for me. I cannot be a disciple for any of you. We each one on our own have to determine whether or not we will be a learner of and a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. Christ. It is an individual responsibility. No one else can make that kind of decision for us or that kind of preparation for us. The godly virtues that we often see demonstrated in the lives of other people are not things that can be borrowed. Oh, I know that all of us have probably sometimes wished that we could borrow the goodness and the godliness that we often see demonstrated in the lives of other people. Perhaps we know someone who is a person of tremendous faith. All kinds of hardships come into his life. All kinds of heartaches and discouragements come into his life. And yet his faith never wavers. His faith grows stronger. And we sometimes say, or perhaps at least think to ourselves, how is he able to bear up under all of the things that he is having to endure? How does he maintain such a strong faith? I wish I had that kind of faith. I wish I could borrow a little bit of the superabundance of faith that he seems to have. But that's not possible, is it? We cannot borrow the faith of someone else. We see someone who is particularly loving and kind. And we may think of ourselves as not being as loving and as kind as we at least always ought to be. There may be times when uh, we're not very loving and times when we are not very lovable. There may be times when we do not show all that much kindness toward other people. And we wish that we could borrow some of the kindness and the love and the gentleness that we see demonstrated in other people. It makes no difference uh, what people say to them or what people do to them. It doesn't seem to rattle them. It doesn't seem to cause them to lose their patience with people. It doesn't seem to cause them to fail to speak kindly to people. Harsh things may be said to them and about them, and yet nevertheless, they show love and kindness. And we wish that we could borrow some of that. And then what about the quality of patience? I have to admit that I'm not a very patient person. I'm like the fellow who prayed for patience and said, Lord, give me patience and give it to me right now. <laughs> That's the way some of us are with reference to patience. But there are others who, who are just the epitome of patience. Nothing ever seems to, to cause them to be impatient. 
Why can't I borrow a little bit of that fellow's patience? This woman seems to be so patient. Why can't, since she has so much of it and I have so little of it, why can't I borrow some of her patience? But it's not the kind of thing that can be done. What about a person's knowledge and grasp of the Scriptures, the Word of God? Do we not know people who have a tremendous knowledge and understanding of the Word of God and we wish that we could borrow just a little bit of that person's knowledge? I'm thinking now of the great gospel preacher Gus Nichols who died in November of 19. 75. Brother Gus studied the Bible five hours every day of his life once he became a preacher of the gospel. Brother Nichols was the first one in his family to obey the gospel. He was up in his older teenage years when he heard the truth and obeyed the gospel. Brother Nichols worked as a farmer, he worked as a coal miner before he ever became a preacher of the gospel. But once he became a preacher, he devoted himself to a study of the Bible five hours a day. The story is told that he was preaching in a gospel meeting in a certain place. And as was always true of August Nichols' sermon, it was chock full of Scripture one scripture after another, quoted from memory, out of the great overflow of his hours of study to drive home the tremendous truths that he was seeking to put across to his audience. And on this particular evening, as he stood at the doors of the auditorium and people were coming out and speaking to him and uh, complimenting his sermon, one lady came by and shook his hand and said to him, Brother Nichols, I would give half of my life to know the Bible as well as you do. And Brother Nichols said, that's about what I've given. That's about what I've given. We cannot borrow someone else's knowledge. We have to read, we have to study, we have to reflect on our own. We have to memorize it. We have to lay it up in our hearts. That's what Brother Nichols did. One of the stories about Brother Nichols that I've always loved is the fact that while he was still farming, though he was also preaching, and he was farming in the old days before tractors were all... Uh, uh, that widely used. He plowed a mule or a team of mules. And it is said that Brother Nichols would go to the field in the morning in his overalls with his team of mules hitched to the plow. And inside uh, the pocket of his bib overalls, he would have a copy of the New Testament. And as he started at the end of one row to plow to the other end, he would pull out that New Testament and he would read a verse of Scripture over and over until he got it pretty well in his mind. And then he would start the team of mules down the row and he would quote that verse of Scripture over and over and over all the way to the end of that row. When the mules reached the end of the row and he was ready to turn around and start back, he would pull his New Testament out and he would read the next verse. And he would get it in his mind. And then all the way back up the row, he would repeat that verse over and over and over in his mind. That's what it takes in order to have a knowledge of God's Word. Now we often see people with an abundance of these good and godly virtues faith and love and kindness and patience and humility and a tremendous knowledge of God's Word. And we wish that there might be some shortcut to these, some way that we could just borrow some of 
these qualities from these people who have such a superabundance of them. But that's not possible. If we have these qualities, if we are to have these qualities, we have to develop them for ourselves. You remember Peter's words in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, where he is talking about what we call the seven Christian graces. He says, for if these things are yours and abound, they make you to be neither unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, neither barren nor unfruitful, in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If these things are yours, and the only way they can become ours is by our own personal development of them. They cannot be borrowed. What about worship? Is worship of such a nature that it can be borrowed? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, reminds all of us not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. Can we loan out our responsibility to assemble with the saints to someone else? Can someone else do that for us? The story is told of two men who were out on the lake one Sunday morning fishing. They'd been out there a couple of hours on Sunday morning, enjoying a beautiful day on the lake fishing, and finally one of them had a pain of conscience. And he turned to his fishing partner and he said, you know, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves out here on the lake on Sunday morning fishing when we ought to be in church. And his fishing partner said, oh, I couldn't have gone this morning anyhow. My wife is sick. <laughs> Hello? I wouldn't have been able to go to church this morning because my wife is sick, but that did not keep me from being able to get out on the lake and fish, or as the case may be, to get out on the golf course and play golf, or whatever it is that one might choose to do over doing what the Lord has commanded all of us as Christians to do on the first day of the week. What about the individual acts of worship? Can they be borrowed? Can someone else take the Lord's Supper from me? Would it do any good if today I were not in the services of the church and I said to my wife, now, honey, when you go to church today, you partake of the Lord's Supper for yourself and then you partake of it for me. When you go to church today, you sing for yourself, but then also sing for me. And when you bow your head in prayer as the prayer is being led, you not only pray, but you also do my praying. And when you lay by in store, when the collection plate is passed, don't only put in what you plan to give, but put in for me as well. Is that the way it works? Can we borrow the individual acts of worship? are those by their very nature, not such as, but what we each one individually must do them. What about the rearing and the guiding of our children? Is that something that, that can be borrowed? Can we borrow the government or the public school system or even the church to do our child rearing for us? Can I neglect my responsibility as a father? If I were a young father with young children still at home, could I neglect my responsibility and say, 
I'm going to borrow the government to train my children for me. I'm going to borrow the public schools to train my children for me. I'm going to borrow the church to do the spiritual training of my children. That's not the way it works. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. That is an individual responsibility that every Christian father sustains toward his children. Paul wrote to the young preacher Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.15 and said, And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Well, where had Timothy from childhood been able to learn the Holy Scriptures. Go back to the first chapter of 2 Timothy to verse 5 where Paul says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned, that means the unpretended, the unhypocritical, in other words, the genuine, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded in you also. Lois, the grandmother, Eunice, the mother, had played a role in the shaping of young Timothy's life. The reason that Timothy had known the Holy Scriptures from childhood is because he had a godly ancestry that had recognized its responsibility to teach him the Scriptures. Rearing our children, guiding our children is not something that can be loaned out to somebody else. And it is not something that we can borrow other entities to do for us. What about preparation for the second coming of Christ and uh, the day of judgment? Is that something that can be borrowed? Go back to our text. That's the very point that Matthew chapter 25 verses 1 through 13 is making. That's the very point of the parable of the five wise and five foolish virgins. That preparation for the second coming of Christ and the day of judgment is something that each one of us has to do for himself or herself. Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether it be good or bad. I often point out that this one verse of Scripture stresses both the universal and individual or personal aspect of judgment. The final judgment is universal in that all will be there. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, but the judgment will be carried out on an individual person-to-person -person basis. Each one will be judged according to what he has done in the body, whether it be good or bad. In Romans 14, 12, Paul said, So then each of us must give account of himself to God. Judgment is universal. Everybody will be there. No one will escape it. But when we stand there, we are going to be individually responsible for our own lives. And that brings us to the final point <clears throat> of this message. Obedience to the gospel. Is that something that can be borrowed? 
Can someone else obey the gospel for me? Can someone else obey the gospel for another person? The writer of the book of Hebrews said in chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, speaking of Christ, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the author of eternal salvation. God is not willing that any should perish. Christ tasted death for every man, for every person who has ever lived or whoever shall live. But salvation is reserved for those who in faith will turn to the Lord in genuine and submissive obedience to His will. And no one else can render that obedience for another. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Salvation, entrance into the kingdom of heaven, is dependent upon personal obedience. In Luke 6, 46, Jesus asked the rhetorical question, and why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Why do people call the Lord, the Lord, and then go on their merry way? without paying any attention to what he has commanded, to what he has taught, to what he has required of us in order to be in a right relationship with him. I think over my years as a preacher of the gospel, I have known some people who would gladly obey the gospel for someone else if they could do that. I think I have known some godly Christian women through the years who, if they could be baptized for their husbands, would do that. But it doesn't work that way. I've known some fathers and mothers who have become greatly concerned about their children who have reached the age of accountability and on past the age of accountability who themselves as children, as young people, have never yet obeyed the gospel. And those parents would gladly be baptized for those children if it would do any good. And I know some adult children who have come to a knowledge of the truth and have obeyed the gospel and have become members of the Lord's church, who, if they could obey the gospel for their parents, who are yet in religious error would gladly do that. But again, it doesn't work that way. Obedience to the gospel is an individual responsibility. There are two interesting verses in the sixth chapter of Galatians. Verse 2 of Galatians 6 says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. There are many ways in which we can help one another. Many ways in which we can borrow from one another, lend to one another, help one another, encourage one another, and bear one another's burdens. And that's what Paul tells us we're to do. Bear ye one another's burdens. And so down in verse 5, it is interesting that Paul just a few words later would write, 
for each one shall bear his own burden. That sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? Bear ye one another's burdens. Verse 2. Each one shall bear his own burden. Verse 5. But we have to understand that the nature of the burdens are different. There are some burdens that we have in this life that we can mutually bear with one another, that we can help one another with. But there are other burdens in this life. There are other responsibilities in this life that no one else can bear for us. They're the kinds of things that cannot be borrowed, the kinds of things we've been talking about this morning in this lesson. And that's where each one of us will, re will become responsible for bearing our own burdens. Well, it's good to be with you this morning. Still uh, two or three minutes before our time's out, but I've said everything that I intended to say during this Bible school hour. And uh, so since I'm through, I will quit. And someone said, well, that's rare for a preacher, for him to quit when he's through, because they've sometimes heard preachers speak who were through several minutes before they got, before they quit. And uh, you may find that to be true of me before this meeting is over. But at least this morning for the Bible school hour, uh, <coughs> this is the message. I commend it to us. I hope it's a good way uh, maybe to get us started in the meeting as we think about our personal and individual responsibilities. And I hope if you're not a Christian, a member of the Lord's Church, or if you're not a faithful Christian, that you will think about your personal responsibility to the Lord. And that during this meeting, even this morning, you will come forward at the singing of the invitation song to confess your faith in Christ, to be baptized into Him, for the remission of your sins, or to come back to the Lord and to be restored. I'm through. I'll quit.